It's interesting that, that the essential features are actually quite the same as they are for native English speakers. The Ortiz PVAD is, is not simply a tool that evaluates English language learners, it's a tool that evaluates anyone who actually speaks English. So native English speakers all the way to very, very limited English speakers. And it's done with a common metric by using English as the language by which to, to evaluate that. What is specific and what is unique and essential for English language learners is the creation of separate norms. You can't really compare the development in language, in English, of a native English speaker to someone who is not a native English speaker. The moment you move beyond one language in your experience, and there are two or more, English being one of them, then the comparison must only be made to individuals with the same degree of exposure that you have uh, to English. And so the real essential feature is establishing norms for comparison of performance that provide the fairness and equity on that basis, language exposure, which cannot be accomplished by using a norm group that is based only on monolingual English speakers. So the test itself has no necessary concession to English language learners other than it is a receptive task, so it doesn't require the person to have to speak much English. But that's the same even for native English speakers. The key being that it does contain a separate set of norms that are appropriate to the individual being evaluated so that you don't make unfair comparisons that lead to discriminatory interpretation. Ideally speaking, you might have a test that's, that is both expressive and receptive. But when you do an expressive test, it introduces some additional variables that might have been too complicated at this time to incorporate into the design of the test. Given that we we're trying to pioneer a universal design to begin with, that would include English speakers or native English speakers all the way to limited English speakers. So it was easier to do that with a receptive type of test. Now receptive test also provides a broader measure of a person's general language competence because it, it reflects more of what they know of the language as opposed to what they can produce or say in the language. Expressive vocabulary is the amount of language a person uses when they're trying to convey their thoughts and their feelings using oral language. So, you know, it, it's narrower in a sense. And we, we didn't want to create a test that might not have the capability of measuring individuals with very limited language. So if you're going with receptive, you would have, you, you can include them, but if you're going with expressive, you would have eliminated them and it wouldn't have been possible. So I think it was a good design choice to start with the receptive kind of task and allow people to demonstrate what they can do. Because for example, in a receptive task, rather than having to define a word that is presented to you and me judging whether or not you got it correct in what you said, and uh, a receptive task allows you to simply know what it means inside and then point or make some indication as to what it means by uh, selecting a particular representation of it, such as a picture that indicates what the, the word's meaning actually is. So that's usually a, a, a lower, lower is probably not the best word, but it's a standard that is easier for people to engage in linguistically than is the expressive component. And so to provide the broadest measure from you know, native English speaker to limited English speaker, receptive was really the way to go. There are several things that I think really make it unique. The, the structure of the test, because you might think, well, another picture vocabulary type test, what's new about that? Well, you'll notice right off the bat that it's computer-based, which means it's scored internally and it's provided on a platform that doesn't involve an easel, doesn't involve looking at, let's say, hand-drawn or illustrations, but actual photos of real objects. The photos themselves are not only realistic, but selected carefully and intentionally to provide good representations of the words and without any kind of anachronisms. It will keep it from being dated many, many years into the future. The person can actually indicate by simply touching the screen or by clicking a mouse. In other words, it now provides for assisted kind of uh, uh, administration. 
these are, I think, things that are very, very unique about it. But even more so was the attention to creating a set of norms that would be appropriate for the individual being evaluated. To do that, we actually had to create two sets, one for native English speakers and one for everybody else who's not a native English speaker, that is, English learners. And that is something that is truly unique because it's not been done before. The test itself incorporates stratification along the lines of amount of English exposure occurring for every individual. Now, for a native English speaker, we wouldn't have to worry about that because age captures that automatically. If you're 10 years old, you've been raised in the U.S. or Canada, you've been speaking English for 10 years, assuming you didn't have another language going on. But if you're an English learner and you came from another country or your parents don't speak English well or at all, then you haven't been learning English for 10 years even though you're 10 years old. You need a set of norms that are appropriate for other English learners like myself who had only had five years worth of exposure to English, not 10, even though we are 10. That is the feature that I think is truly unique in that it now provides a mechanism for comparing test performance in English that will be valid and will not have the kind of discriminatory outcomes that have been there previously due to low scores in that relative comparison. The answer is really basic and really simple. There is no way to compare the performance of English learners to the performance of native English speakers when you're talking about language. The reason is native English speakers have been learning their language, let's say that's English, for their entire lives. So it's easy to say, well, let's create a group of native English speakers, stratify them by age, and we compare eight-year-olds to eight-year-olds because all eight-year-olds have had the same amount of exposure in English for their lives. But an English learner doesn't have that. They may have six years worth of English instead of eight. They may have one year. They may have none. For example, in my case, I was five years old when I started school at the age of five. I was probably not an English speaker at all. Very limited, maybe a couple words here or there. I like to say that my first words in English were red light, green light, which comes from the game that we used to play on the blacktop out there. So I had very limited English ability or English development, but I had five years worth of Spanish. Yet I wasn't evaluated, and even today I might not be evaluated by native language, or I might be. But if you were going to hold me accountable in English, which is what we tend to do with the educational system, that is, how well can I read, write, and do math in English, nobody really cares how well I can do that in, in Spanish, then to compare me to other five-year-olds who have had five years' worth of English language development would be patently unfair. I don't have that. That means my score would come out very low. You would think I have a speech-language impairment. And that's why we have a great deal of overrepresentation, particularly disproportionality in special education these days, because there is no way to make that comparison. The only way to do that is to have a separate set of norms for English language learners. But it isn't even enough to just say, let's have a bunch of English learners and we'll stratify them by age. It must be not only by age, but also by the length of English exposure each one has had within each of those age ranges. Without control for the length of exposure, then you will continue to evaluate individuals and compare them perhaps unfairly to other individuals who might have far greater development in that language. So you need a separate norm simply because bilinguals are not the same in terms of their development as monolinguals and then you need to control length of exposure even within the English learner group or you have no hope of creating some type of normative base that would provide a fair and equitable comparison. One of the, I think, more impressive features is going to be the interpretive summary that is generated along with the scoring. So it's not just a scoring report, but a summary that is intended to provide direct intervention. There is a section within the interpretive summary that will give specific guidelines on where the child is linguistically and what needs to be done. And I think this is very important because it doesn't matter who you're evaluating or what language they speak, what grade they're in, or whether they do or don't have a disability. That's a diagnostic question. But even when you know they have a disability or you know they don't have a disability, you still have to intervene. You still have to do something to help that child in an instructional manner. And so we will have a section that actually says, here is where the child is linguistically and here's what needs to be done.
And it works for both native English speakers because it assumes the grade level standard and then says how far below is that child. And that'll give you an indication as to what kind of interventions and the intensity that will be necessary to help that child go back to grade level or to reach grade level. And the same thing with English learners. It will determine how far off they are from grade level standards and be able to provide an indication as to the degree of intensity necessary of those interventions to bring that child somewhat back up to grade level. And again, these are separate issues from the diagnostic component. The diagnostic component is based on a different comparison which evaluates the children compared to each other. The intervention compares children to grade level standards so that you know exactly what kind of instruction is necessary even when there is no disability or even when there is a disability. So it can help probably in writing IEP goals and objectives for example because it will work whether or not the child has been identified as having a disability or not. So if they are identified and you do develop IEP goals and objectives, these instructional interventions would be very appropriate to say here's what the child needs right now and then you can actually follow that child and track them and say, okay, let's evaluate progress later on and we can say, hey, they're improving and so now we need these kinds of interventions to be appropriate. So it's something that I think is very, very valuable and kind of unique when it comes to the Ortiz PVAT. The overall quality of the test is phenomenal and I have to say, there were no shortcuts taken here, none. The, the time that was devoted to the construction, the overall design, the implementation, the psychometrics, everything has been done exactly the way that it's supposed to be done. And I know because I teach courses in scaling and measurement and I teach scale development so I know what's supposed to happen and it all happened. And I, I you know, was kind of blown away by that. It, it's weird to think, well, why shouldn't it happen? But to see it actually in practice was, was phenomenal. So the quality is there, the attention to detail, the manner in which the test is given, the, the time it took to select the photographs, to represent the words and the options, to make sure that they were all of equal salience and provided an imagery that was not only not offensive, but culturally appropriate, relevant to people in general, um, it, 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 it is amazing. And I think when people see the test, what they're going to see is not just another vocabulary test, but something that actually has a very different look and feel to the assessment of vocabulary. And then you step beyond that and you start thinking, oh my God, it's also a test that can be used with anybody, anyone. It doesn't matter if your practice involves modeling with English speakers. This is a test that will do that job very, very well and in a highly engaging, highly uh, efficient manner and it's comprehensive. The number of items that are contained are is phenomenal. It, it is not a screener, it is not something that's quick and dirty, although it is quick, it doesn't take much time, but it uses all the latest technology, psychometrics and everything involved to create what I think is a very modern looking and modern moving test, more so than tests that I've seen that currently exist. And you throw the English language learner component on top of that you have a test that is applicable to anyone that's going to walk into your office or anyone that you're going to be asked to evaluate in any particular setting, whether it's a clinic, a school, private practice, doesn't make any difference. And so it has these kinds of advantages that you're not going to get in something else. It is, I think, designed in a way that is leading toward what we're going to see in terms of test development in the future.